Welcome everyone to another new episode of Innovation Coffee. I'm again, we're back here again with uh, Robert Wolf and Alessandro Grande. And uh, today it's RP2040 special with Eben Apton. So we're lucky enough to have Eben Apton, um, founder of Raspberry Pi on the show today. And we have a lot of questions for, for Eben coming up. Um, and we've got um, also a cool demo uh, done by, by another person on the team that we'll introduce to you in, uh, in a little while. But before that, as usual, uh, Robert, shall we do a little recap of last week? Yes, please. Yes, please. And I, I'm also very excited about today. But as always, uh, let's talk about last week. So uh, we were joined by Kwabena Agyeman, uh, who is the founder, president or co-founder and president of OpenMB. It was a really fun episode. Uh, I don't recommend going and checking it out right now, but after the stream, definitely go check that out. We talked about the OpenMB camera, lots of future products that they have coming up as well as their custom IDE that they use for their product line. So um, definitely check that out. And uh, back to you, Alessandro, let's, let's bring on our guest. Yeah, I think it's, it's time to uh, bring on Eben. So here we go. Eben, founder and CEO of Raspberry Pi on the show. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's exciting to have you to have you on the show with us. And uh, uh, I'm really, really keen to talk about the RP2040 and the uh, latest developments and all the different things. So uh, yeah, cheers. Yeah, I have my coffee. Cheers, guys. <laughs> clink. Cheers. Clink. clink. <laughs> sad, sad pandemic virtual clink. Yes. But as usual, before we get started and talk about the technology, um, I really want to kind of give you a chance to introduce yourself. And perhaps, you know, given that people know you, uh, rather than like, you know, tell uh, kind of the, the, the story that everybody knows, let's tell maybe some people, people um, some of the anecdotes, uh, interesting anecdotes of how you got here, where you are today. Okay. Um, let's see. Um... Well, I'm a gamer. I, I, well, I, I, okay, so here's an arm thing. I grew up with a BBC Micro in my bedroom. I grew up with a BBC Micro in my classroom. And I grew up with, a, then I grew up with a BBC Micro in my bedroom. So I have the, I grew up with the, the precursor of the precursor of the precursor of the architectures that we all spend our time playing with today in my life. And I remember buying, there was in the UK, there was a, a magazine called The Micro User. Um, which I think had been called BBC Micro User for the first couple of issues back in the early 80s before the BBC pointed out to them they were allowed to do that. Um, and it was called the Micro User. It was, about the B it, was about, it was originally about the BBC Micro, but then it was about Acorn, your progenitor. Um, and um, I remember at the age of, I will have been 10, um, reading about this thing called the ARM architecture. And I remember reading about this, I remember reading about pipelining, and I remember reading about conditional execution, which I guess are probably the two kind of distinguishing features uh, of, um, uh, of, Sophie's, um, of so Sophie's first uh, ARM architecture. Um, and uh, and I, it was, it's really strange, you know, I kind of, it's strange to imagine that there's this length, that's, I'm 42 now, so this is a long time ago. And it's strange to imagine that there's this kind of 32 years, it's nice, it's 32 actually, 32 year span um, between my first learning about the ARM architecture and the organization I'm involved with um, shipping its first, um, shipping its first product, its first first party silicon product uh, that can actually execute ARM instructions, albeit not those ARM instructions, because of course, remember, Codex M0 Plus only executes thumb instructions, but you know, it's, uh, it's great. Right, and I remember at the time thinking how badly I wanted one. Um, and quite a lot of, I'd still, you know, how badly I wanted one, specifically how badly I wanted an Acorn Archimedes. Um, and it's kind of a thing that I still get a kick out of with Raspberry Pi is that Raspberry Pi is the biggest shipper of RISC OS compatible um, <laughs> RISC OS. You can still run the Acorn RISC OS from the 1990s. Uh, we are the biggest shipper of RISC OS compatible hardware in the world. Um, so that's probably, that's how I, that's how I started. I'm a software engineer. I was a games programmer as a kid, always wanted to be a games programmer as an adult. Um, started a games company when I was quite young, realized I didn't want to be in the games industry. It's an awful industry. <laughs> yeah. um, and then became a Silicon guy. Um, and then that's probably those two, those kind of two experiences, the one of kind of being interested in software and sort of software on fairly low, fairly low power um, systems that could do interesting things. Uh, and then having come from a Silicon background, the two things that sort of kind of fed together into making the Raspberry Pi platform. It's, it's funny because you... 
I still think I'm a software engineer. I had to be talked into your know, Raspberry Pi was here. A lot of the cool stuff people do with Raspberry Pi, it's done using the GPIO pins on Raspberry Pi. I had to be talked into putting GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. I couldn't see the point. Um, uh, <laughs> Pete Lomas, my co-founder, said, well, look, the chip's got these GPIO pins. You should bring them out to a 0.1-inch header. And I was very much like, oh, God, must we? Um, uh, and, of course, we did. And, and so, so kind of... Um, like so many things with Raspberry Pi, the success has uh, got a large accidental element to it, uh, from my point of view. It, it's it's funny because you say you know you had this BBC Micro in your room and in your classroom, and then now there's this entire generation of people who are going to grow up saying, "I had a Raspberry Pi in my classroom, I had a Raspberry Pi in my bedroom," and you know, ten years from now, twenty years from now, that's going to be their story. The future yeah. entrepreneurs and chip makers, you know, are going to be saying that story. So that's just awesome. And I, I'm going to fanboy a little bit. In 2012, I got my first Raspberry Pi and I never thought eight years, nine years down the line, I'd be sitting here in a, in a live stream with you. So, you know, thank you so much for joining us. And if, and if one person, like if one person has the, in the world ends up with the affection that I have, one of the wonderful things about Raspberry Pi, of course, is I've got, is I've got to meet um, the, the interesting thing about the BBC is that this whole thing that we call home computing is a very short span of time. It's only a little over 40 years. Um, and many of the people who involved in founding Acorn were in their early 20s uh, when they when they did so. And so lots of the people are still very, they're still very, very young. They're still very young today. And I've got to meet, you know, um, uh, Sophie, uh, Steve Ferber, uh, uh, Chris Curry, Herman Hauser. Um, I've got to meet all of these people. Um, uh, which is kind of cool. So I get to fa I get to fanboy all the time. And if there's one person who who has the same affection for Raspberry Pi in 30 years' time that I have for the BBC Micro, then that will have been a that will have been a a, a, a great outcome. You know, there BBC Micro is still an amazing machine. Um, and 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 still, and then obviously the 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 uh, the Archimedes is a real real testament to what small teams of highly motivated people can do if you give them the tools they need. Awesome, awesome. So on that note, Evan, there is one thing that we want to do to kind of, there's two things we're going to do to break the ice here, and then we're going to dive right into the RP2040. Uh, first of all, I want to take a little bit of a step back, and I know you kind of shared your, your path to where you are now, but maybe you could share for these future entrepreneurs, for these people who might be looking to do things like you've done, um, one or two things, your ups and downs in the industry, the one, the one or two ups and downs that you've had that kind of led you to where you are right now. Uh, if, if someone comes across some of these issues, they can always say, "Hey, you know what? I'm I'm okay because uh, you know I just chugged along and kept going." Uh, maybe you could well, share chugging, along and, keep, chugging yeah. along and keeping going. I mean, that's one of them. <laughs> um, Raspberry Pi Foundation was incorporated in 2008, two years after we first started thinking. About it. I built the first thing that you would call a Raspberry Pi, uh, that you could vaguely call a Raspberry Pi in about 2006. Um, so 2006, you start trying to do it. 2008, you incorporate a foundation. We shipped our first product in 2012. That's a very long time. Actually, it's pretty comparable to the amount of time that's elapsed since we launched the product. Um, so it has an enormous, Raspberry Pi has an enormous prehistory. Um, uh, um, and at many points in that, I just became bored and wandered off and did other stuff. Um, and um, and, and the product went, the project went dormant. Um, uh, and finding ways to keep yourself motivated over long periods of time is, I think, an important thing if you want to do, um, well, if you want to do anything meaningful. Um, there are things, there are meaningful things you can do very quickly. And one of the things I used to enjoy about games programming is you can make an enjoyable thing. If you get a good mechanic, you can make an enjoyable um, game in an afternoon. And that's that's very, very motivating. Um, but particularly if you want to do anything with hardware and you want to do anything with silicon, it just takes time, particularly silicon, right? It takes ages. Um, and you have to find ways to to keep yourself motivated. And for me, that was my family, really, that I would go off and do other things and I'd go and try and talk to particularly my, my, my wife and my parents. Um, about the new stuff, I, oh, I'm going to go do this thing. And bless them, they always used to say, what about that Raspberry Pi thing? Though? That was a good thing. You should go do that. Um, uh, and so that, that that really helped. So that's one thing. Um, I guess, um, you know, systems always, systems always break. You know, like you, you build things and they don't work, and then you've got to build them again and they work a bit better. Um, so it's all it's all really a perseverance story. It's all really just about trying to co cope with the ups and downs and trying to have the uh, the, the mental resilience, I think. Um, the mental resilience and the people around you to get you through the bad days. And one thing that gets, I mean, one thing I always say that gets us through the bad days, because we do still have them, um, people send us pictures of their kids programming. 
programming Raspberry Pis. Um, when we launched the Raspberry Pi 400, uh, which is so the Raspberry Pi 400 launched last um, uh, um, November, nobody in between Acorn building Archimedes and us building RP2040 had built a PC built on the ARM architecture, a real PC built on the ARM, uh, a consumer PC built on the ARM architecture. And we did it. Um, and the wonderful thing about it is, has the form factor of one of those 1980s machines. It's a computer and a keyboard. Um, and uh, and you, we started to get these pictures of kids lying on the floor in the living room with the telly up there, the TV up there, and their Raspberry Pi 400 in front of them and a the cable going up there and ooh, like that. And that was so much my experience of, of, of computing as a child. Um, and so much my my contemporaries uh, think those pictures are really good actually you know they are they're kind of like oh you know we're having a bad day oh you know but look look someone just sent me a picture of their kid who made yeah you know, particularly th things like scratch talk about immediacy right scratch has this wonderful I made the cat move uh, you know the kid I made a cat move. Uh, and we have a shop in Cambridge. And actually, one of the great things about the shop in Cambridge is a wonderful source of I made the cat move moments because we have machines, Raspberry Pi's running scratch in there. People come in and make the cat move and go, I made the cat move. <laughs> um, so, so it's those things. It's finding finding ways inside yourself and ways around yourself um, to, to stay motivated when things are when things are tough. And But things always go wrong, um, you know. Um, and Raspberry Pi is by far the longest I've ever managed to do one thing for. I've been doing it for... <laughs> Well, well, by some imagined stretch of the imagination, 15 years. Raspberry Pi, the original, the 2006 era Raspberry Pi is it's April. So it's 15, it's over 15 years old now. Um, wow. and, and that's a long time. I'm 42. I'll be 43 on Monday, uh, but I'm 42. And um, it's, um, you know, I had, I, I'd love to say I had hair. Uh, <laughs> when I, I didn't have hair when I started. There we are. Yeah, I, I was a very early hair loser. Um, and uh, but I did have a little bit more hair than this when I started. Well, and you, thank you for fact, I think you may even have a picture of me from when I was uh, a little bit younger than I am now. Let's do it. Yeah, there you yeah. go. There's the segue, Alessandro. That's the segue. Yeah, I was gonna just say, like, you know, thank you for sharing, uh, you know, your point of view and and some of your experience. It's uh, I always find it you know useful to hear other people's experiences, and I hope you know people watching it also find it useful. Uh, but as Robert said, we have you know we we have two two kind of icebreakers. And the second one is uh, what we like to call, what were you thinking? So let's bring that up. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. So as usual, this is the segment where we pick random pictures of you online and have you kind of talk talk through like, what were you thinking in that picture and give a bit of background of what that picture was about, right? So let's start with the first one. Here we go. What was I this? Know, what were you look thinking? At him, look at him, he's, how old is he? He's 33, probably 33, 34. Um, I did have a little bit more hair there, I think. I was a little bit more kind <laughs> of around here, a little bit maybe. Um, what I'm thinking mostly is my arm hurts. Um, uh, photojournalists love this pose. Looks really dramatic because you get bokeh. You can put the you can put the, the board into focus and then get get the me and the bokeh all the other way around. Um, uh, yeah, it really hurts. Try it. Pick a Raspberry Pi and hold your arm out like that for a minute, let alone a ten minute photo shoot. It it hurts. That's what I'm thinking there. But that was probably our first bit of mainstream media coverage. I mean, the mainstream, yeah, interestingly about Raspberry Pi is it's gradual transition from being a very much a tech industry geeky thing to being a very mainstream brand in a lot of places. Um, but this was a very early piece with The Guardian, went down to um, to, to York Road, isn't it, in their, their office on York Road in London next to King's Cross, uh, and she did this did this photo shoot for... Yeah. Um, and that's, of course, that, that, of course, is a weird thing that I'm holding, right? So this is... This is pre-launch, so this is that's an alpha, what we call an alpha board, and so that's a that's a twenty-eight thirty-five, which is the chip that's on Raspberry Pi One. That's actually a dev kit. That's actually a a, a board that was built for us by Broadcom chip vendor, um, uh, and that's what we used for software development and some early community stuff. There were about fifty or sixty of those exist. Uh, I think I have one. Um, quite a lot of them are in museums now. Um, and uh, they are, so from a software perspective, a Raspberry Pi. And I used to have a spreadsheet that told me where they all were. We've gone from a world where I had a spreadsheet that told me where every Raspberry Pi was, and I would phone up people on the spreadsheet every week and say, wow. are you using it? Send it back to me if you're not, uh, yeah. to a world where we make 
20,000 of them a day. Yeah, people are – someone in the chat said, that's not a pie. It's like, that's a pie one alpha. Mm. So is that, is, is that – I think today? our operating system release still works. So Don Copley, who, who, who's one of the earliest people to do software for Raspberry Pi and uh, now works for us here, um, he, I believe, keeps our OS release working on the alpha board. And I think there are community members who have alpha boards who complain to Dom if he breaks the alpha board support. So you can get our latest operating system, go to our website today, it'll run on that. I mean, that's the attitude to, that's the Raspberry Pi attitude to to forwards and backwards compatibility and obsolescence. Uh, um, we, we don't believe in it. Um, so we, we do do our best. It's incredibly slow compared to a Raspberry Pi 4. It's about a 40th the speed of a Raspberry Pi 4, uh, but it will build the desktop. And while we're here, I was actually going to bring up a question from the audience um, that I think, you know, I imagine this, this comes up often. Um, why the Raspberry Pi name? Any personal reason? Well, Raspberry is fruit named computer companies. Um, there are a number of fruit named computer companies um, uh, in the UK. In Cambridge, we had tangerine. Um, uh, <laughs> there's apricot. Uh, obviously, technically, acorn. An acorn is technically a fruit. So, so even your ancestor is a, is a fruit named computer company. Um, I think there were one or two other ones as well. Um, and uh, there are actually so many that there aren't there there aren't that many fruits left. Um, so. <laughs> One of them, raspberry is also. Um, that's <laughs> um, we're appealing to children, right? Um, and, and so Roald Dahl, the children's author Roald Dahl, had an idea that the fun, that a funny thing that can happen for children is when adults fart. Um, and the funniest thing that could happen for a child would be if the queen were to fart. Um, and so there is there is very definitely a, an appeal to the childish side of us um, there. And in pie is Python, big believers in Python. I'm in fact um, raspberry pie. Uh, RP2040 and Raspberry Pi Pico um, both run Python as their high-level programming language of choice. So Python, that thread of Python, runs almost all the way through the Raspberry Pi story. PI, because we thought the Pi logo, the Pi le the letter Pi would make a good logo. In the end, we've ended up with a picture of a Raspberry as well. Um, but, mm. but it was too late by then. Awesome. No, thank you for sharing that as well. Okay, let's let's quickly go through another couple of pictures. So I'll pull up the second one. What were you thinking here? We found this, and we thought this would be interesting to talk about. Ah, yes, this is um, the TARDIS. This is um, Dave Ackerman's TARDIS. So very early in, in the history of um, uh, Raspberry Pi, um, people, Dave, um, started to send them up under weather balloons and take photos from the edge of space. And you can see there a picture, um, uh, a little framed picture, and that's the Raspberry Pi that went up. Uh, and Dave put this together for me. Um, uh, and and I, we still we still have it, actually, um, his TARDIS. And he sent a lot of interesting things up in space. I think he sent a potato up for Heston Blumenthal, the chef. Um, he sent all sorts, of, all sorts of bits and pieces up over the years. I think he's probably sent Picos up already. Interesting thing about this, it's a really good example of how activities around Raspberry Pi migrate from adult hobbyists to adventurous schools to less adventurous schools. So a couple of years after Dave was doing this, you started to find the occasional secondary school doing it. Then we ran a program actually called Sky Academy. We have a teacher training program called Pi Academy. We ran a special Pi Academy called Sky Academy, which taught people where Dave, Dave came down and helped us uh, and taught people to uh, to do this, uh, to, to, to do how, because it's a slightly involved, it's quite actually quite cheap. You know, weather balloon costs a hundred bucks and you need about a hundred bucks of hydrogen to stick in it. I've got to be a little bit careful with that. Um, and then a Raspberry Pi, but you do need to, there's a bit of trial and error involved. So we taught a bunch of teachers to do it. They started doing it with their classes, then other classes started doing it. And that's really the flow, not just for high altitude ballooning, but for all sorts of Raspberry Pi stuff, whether it's robotics or um, IoT things or AI. It starts with the adults, it starts with the geeks, it starts with the hobbyists, and then it flows down into education and industry. And that's really been the Raspberry Pi experience. For us. Love that. Cool, let's go through the third one quickly. Let, let's hope, so I've got a bunch more, but let's just pick the third one. Let's see what this one was. Yes, I think I, this is a nice one because I'm uh, I'm in Cambridge as well, right? And uh, I remember when this happened. This Tell is the shop. What you were thinking here. This is the shop. I'm thinking I'm happy to be sitting in my shop, which I would be love, I'd be super happy to be sitting in my shop right now because it would mean it was <laughs> open. Um, it will open a week on Monday um, uh, when restrictions relax. Um, uh, but yes, we have a shop in the Grand Arcade in the middle of Cambridge. It's the only one we have at the moment. Um, but it's one a wonderful place for us to for for 
I hope it's a wonderful place for customers, particularly less technically savvy customers, to come and get familiar with Raspberry Pi. A lot of people have heard of Raspberry Pi, don't really know what it is. Um, this is a great place for someone to come and sit, just sit down and play with one or talk to a member of staff um, about the platform. It's also a great place for us to learn about our customers and critically to learn about our not customers. Companies obsess too much over their customers because the customers are the people they've got a relationship with. You shouldn't worry about your customers. I mean, be nice to them, but uh, you already won the battle with your customers. Your not customers are the really interesting ones because they can tell you why they don't like your product or why they don't understand your product or why they don't care about your product. Um, and so this is a wonderful place for us to go and talk to them as well. Very cool. We're getting some comments, actually, and then I'll let Robert um, move on to the next part. But we're getting some interesting comments on origin, like people's origin stories around Raspberry Pi, right? So I'll bring up this one from Larry, actually, um, Larry Bank. So he, he says that he got uh, introduced to Raspberry Pi in 2015, and um, someone pointed out to him that he could use a Raspberry Pi 2 as a, um, basically as a working, as a workstation for ARM, um, you know, rather than like buying an expensive DK uh, or use any other prototype. I imagine, yeah, other, other boards effectively. So that's quite interesting, right? Like there is a lot of, there's been a lot of interesting conversations around, um, you know, can you, is there a development board, a development station for people, right? Uh, for developers developing for other uh, ARM devices. And I think, you know, ARM Raspberry Pi has become time and time again, an interesting um, development station or development kit or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, you know, you, you mentioned before, it's moving from, um, just a, a single board computer to being a computer effectively, right? So it's quite, it's, it's been through an interesting journey. And I think, you know, to kind of um, get Robert set up, I, I was, uh, I was just gonna say, you know, so you've gone from being um, developing dev boards for mostly education to actually developing computers to now developing chips, right? And I'm, you know, today, I think we're going to focus on this last bit, right? I'm, I'm really keen to get your inputs on this and uh, what brought you to this point. So, Robert, do you want to start asking the first question? We've Absolutely. I'm going to I'm going to remove this here real quick. And, and I want to remind everyone who's watching right now, um, we did do a segment with uh, Gordon Hollingworth and Luke Wren, both also from Raspberry Pi. I'm going to share this uh, this link here in the chat right now. So if you want to go learn all about the Raspberry Pi Pico, cruise on over to this link after this stream. You can go learn all about the Raspberry Pi Pico. In this episode, we're going to be talking with Evan about the RP2040, which is the chip behind the Raspberry Pi Pico. So uh, on that note here, Evan, first thing, uh, first question I have is why MCU? So why did, why did Raspberry Pi choose to first off build an MCU over anything else? Um. If you look at all other Raspberry Pi main product, we have make accessories, but you look at all other Raspberry Pi core products, they're all Linux computers. They're all Linux PCs of varying levels of power, and quite a broad range of price performance points, right? So we have a $5 Raspberry Pi Zero, which is actually very similar to that original uh, board that you showed there in terms of performance, um, all the way up to a $75, eight gigabyte um, uh, um, Raspberry Pi 4 or the $70 RP2040. Right, so the, 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 the 2040 Raspberry Pi 400, got my numbers right. Um, so, so which is our workstation product. There you are, it's in the background there, which is our workstation. You talked about an ARM workstation, that's our ARM workstation, right? Um, so, but they're all the same, right? They're all, they run the same operating system all the way back to that alpha board you showed. They're all Linux platforms. Um, we're interested in the, and what, what what we find is, you know, those are great for a lot of things, right? They have an enormous, particularly the recent ones, enormous amount of processing power on them. Uh, they can drive you know, your RP20, your your Raspberry Pi 400. I keep doing it. Your Raspberry Pi 400 can drive two uh, Ultra HD displays, right? Um, it can it can access USB 3 storage. It's got gigabit Ethernet and 11 AC Wi-Fi. It can do lots of cool things. Um, but when you deploy, particularly the Raspberry Pi single board computer in the world, there are things it can't do. Um, what can it do? Well, it can't read analog inputs. Um, it doesn't have especially good real time. You can kind of monkey with it to get fairly good real time interfacing to pins, but it's not really designed um, to give you the ability to say, you know, poll a GPIO pin every cycle 
and see what and see what's going on out in the world. So it's not, uh, and it and it and there's a flaw on the power consumption as well. So you know because it has these all, all this complexity in it, um, you're not going to get the thing down to less than 100 milliwatts, even a Raspberry Pi Zero to less than 100 milliwatts of power consumption. So there are places you can't go. Because what you find is you find people pairing a Raspberry Pi with a microcontroller board of one of a very large number of microcontroller boards to get the best of both worlds. And we've never really been able to offer anything that we thought was particularly. We only do things if we think they're compelling. Like we don't really make me two products. Um, and we've never been able to kind of put together an idea of about a microcontroller board that wasn't just a me too microcontroller board. Um, and so the only way to actually do something differentiated was really to go and the team decided to sit down and ask themselves what would our perfect microcontroller look like. And Luke, obviously, Luke was very closely involved in that you mentioned earlier. Um, they, they sat down, they asked themselves, what would a perfect microcontroller for our applications look like? Uh, and at the end of that process, sat down, did some design. At the end of that process, what came out was RP2040. Um, yeah, so it was really about, it was about having to go, not taking the easy road. Every, nobody else, I think, has addressed the microcontroller board market by going and taping out a chip before. Um, but Raspberry Pi has never really taken the easy road to any of the any of the things it's done. Um, and this is just the natural extension of that. I, I love that answer. And by the way, Luke is an amazing person. Uh, He's we great. love having him on the show. He's so awesome. He's 25 yeah. years old. He's 25 yeah. years old. I mean, I don't know anything. That's crazy. I, I still don't it's know impressive. anything. I really don't know <laughs> when I was 25 years old. But yet Luke is... <laughs> Uh, you know, if you, he's absolutely worth following him on Twitter. He does an enormous amount of very enjoyable stuff in his in his spare time that he tweets about, um, and obviously has been right at the heart of making sure that RP twenty forty is the best microcontroller we could build. Awesome, awesome. So fantastic! I, I, you know, that was a really good a good answer. Um, the next question I had for you was, uh, what brought you you to you and Raspberry Pi to like think about creating a dual core? Uh, Cortex M0 plus over a uh, single core uh, MCU. The interesting thing about dual core is that it gives you the ability to um, supervise. You can have an application core and a supervisory and a hardware supervision core. Um, so if you look at kind of what what are the what are the three interesting things about RP2040, the three real like distinguishing features. One is it actually has a lot of RAM. So it has a you know for a for an for an entry level microcontroller. Uh, it has a quarter of a megabyte of RAM. It has 264K of available RAM plus a little bit. Um, uh, and that's really important because it gives kind of people, gives people room to breathe, right? If you're developing for it, you're not constantly fighting for space like you typically would be on, a, on, a, on another microcontroller in its class. So a lot of memory. You've got the PIOs, which I guess we'll talk about a little bit more in a bit. But these are things that let you inter interact, do that interaction, that very fine-grained interaction with pins, in a programmable way. Um, and then it's a dual core platform. Um, and what's nice about dual core platform, you can run your C program, or you can run the MicroPython interpreter on one of the cores. Um, and then you can run, you can the other core can be dedicated to supervising a piece of hardware. So it can be dedicated either to directly supervising a piece of hardware, remember I mentioned sort of asking a pin, reading a GPIO pin every cycle and waiting for it to go from naught to one. So you can have a processor that just does that. Or, more efficiently, you can have it supervise the PIO, which is doing the low-level um, pin management. And that turns out to be a very flexible, so lots of RAM, application core, hardware supervision core. If you are not need a hardware supervision core, which a lot of the time actually we discover people don't, um, then what you can do is you can, particularly under, um, you can run RTOS, which will let you run threads on both of them. You can run MicroPython, uh, bare metal MicroPython, which again will let you run threads on both. So it is an additional pool of resource. Um, uh, you do see other multi-core microcontrollers. I think the interesting thing about this one is that it's completely symmetric. The design is yes. extremely clean and symmetric. Um, there is no, neither core is the special core. They are just a pair of completely identical cores with completely identical interfacing into the um, bus, into the system bus matrix. Uh, one of them, I think, has, you know, I, th I think there's one reg there's one difference between them, which is there's a register you can read in SIO space, which returns zero if you're one, if you're the first processor and one if you're the second processor. That's really from the software, from the programmer's perspective, that's the entire difference between. Them. Awesome. Okay, really cool. Um, the next question, I mean, we've kind of covered already, um, you know, why you did, uh, why why you actually 
came up with a chip or decided to actually build a chip yourself, right? But I'm curious if if in the in the process, um, the, actually, let me take a step back. Um, you know, for many years there was a lot of feedback around like how hard it was or how expensive it was to actually uh, develop uh, silicon. And, uh, you know, like in, in recent years, ARM has taken some steps. And uh, one of these steps is ARM Flexible Access to really mm -hmm. kind of enable um, different companies that haven't developed silicon before to to um, to have access to um, to designs IP and, and, and actually um, be able to, to, to come up with silicon. I wonder if, if that, Played a role, or if uh, you know, if anything else played a role, like what brought you to build a, a chip now, effectively? Well, AFA is the flexible access program has been is, is a, it's a great program, right? So it's a wonderful innovation, right? If only because it makes available. There's there's always a I think there's a chicken and egg problem sometimes in semiconductor IP licensing where you don't know which core you want until you've looked at the core, and you can't get the core until you've licensed it. Um, and so the nice thing about AFA, it's not like all um, IP is in flexible access, but enough of it's in flexible access. Actually, a lot, quite a broad range of chips can be built from the menu. Once you're in the flexible access program, you get access to all the IP. So you can run calls off against each other. You can say, would I rather have an M3 or an M4? Would I rather have an A53 or an A35? Um, uh, so that's that's extremely, that's, 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 a, that's a real bonus. And I think it's, it, it's likely to be helpful probably in future um, Raspberry Pi in future Raspberry Pi designs. Um, it's, you know, developing silicon is expensive and is not getting any cheaper. Um, but it is, in some respects, particularly with programs like that, getting a little bit, um, not getting cheaper, but perhaps it's getting easier. But it's getting easier to make good decisions, I would think, uh, not to have to make an arbitrary decision and then live with it. You can make, you can, you can have a go at making a decision and then, and then back it out. Um, so that was something we that's something we really welcomed. Um, obviously, there are some other great initiatives that are there's um, custom instructions. Obviously, not available on M zero plus, but available on some of the subsequent ones. That's another probably another sign of increasing flexibility in the ecosystem. Um, kind of quite keen to find a way to make a chip that, that that has a core in that supports custom instructions. No clear idea for what custom instruction I would like, but it's it's nice idea to be able to make some custom instructions, there, isn't it? That's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I think that answers all of those questions that we had up there. I'm glad that the arm flexible, uh, the arm flexible uh, access program played a role. Uh, mm -hmm. And for those of you who are listening, please just go search on Google. If you aren't familiar with that program, you can go search on Google and find everything you need to know about that. Um, so th this is a good question here. Uh, is Raspberry Pi changing? Is the business model changing? Are you guys evolving into what used to be an educational program? Are you taking on these new, um, you know, this new business model becoming a chip company? Is is are are you able to talk about that? Because I mean, I, I think a lot of people would be interested to know where the, where the future Raspberry Pi lays. Well, I think the soul of Raspberry Pi is always in um, single board computers. I mean, I think it's. Um, uh, it's a bit of a myth, actually, that Raspberry Pi's customer base is educational. Um, we sold 7 million Raspberry Pis last year. Uh, probably on only a million of those um, uh, were, were educational. Um, uh, about roughly 4 million were, um, were industrial. So Raspberry Pis, you know, if you look at it by volume and probably by revenue, Raspberry Pi is an industrial computer company, um, industrial and commercial computer company. Um, it, but making computers is probably always going to be at the heart of the business. Um, the interesting thing, obviously, about RP2040 is it was it was built to build a board, but once it exists, other people find it interesting. So very, very early on in the in in, in well, very early on um, the end of January, um, it seems like a very long time ago. Like time seems weird at the moment. It seems sort of very stretched, but also very compressed. Um, so way back in the end of at the, at the end of January, um, one thing we found some people were doing when they got there. Uh, Pico, they got the queue for Pico. We've taken about 1.1 million orders for Picos at the moment, shipped between three and 400,000 of them. Um, so it's still quite a queue, but people who got them, some of them were desoldering the RP2040 off them, you know, sacrificing Picos to get their hands on one RP2040. Um, uh, and so when you see people doing that, you start to think, well, yeah, should we support people? So we have done a samples program. Uh, we have, you know, some people have, uh, there is a, uh, I'll, shall I, I will mention it. There is the secret to the samples program. Uh, my DMs are open on Twitter uh, if people wish to DM me about getting samples. 
Um, and we've sent out some, we have these little envelopes that have 10 RP2040s uh, and 10 of the flash chips. And we don't have flash on our chips, so you have to put an external spy flash down next to it. So we have 20 chips in this little little uh, foil bag. And we send them out to people um, who, who can tell a plausible story in my DMs about what they're going to do with them. Um, so there's kind of a dawning realization. I wouldn't describe it as being kind of an intentional change to the business model, but there is a dawning realization that it is a good, it is a good chip. Um, it does. It is differentiated from other um, from other microcontrollers in, in a bunch of interesting ways, particularly around I/O. Um, and, and so we are trying to find ways to get them out to people. Um, I think once supply eases a little bit, you know, once Pico is not in backlog, um, I think there is an aspiration to at least on a small scale start to get these chips out to people. I, I honestly, I love it. You know, I mean, Raspberry Pi, like since the very beginning, has just been such a in my, in my experience, such a reputable company. And so, I mean, the more the more branches that you all touch in this tech space, I feel that the more reputable this space becomes. And so I, I love seeing that you guys are branching out into this. And I have my share of those 7 million boards from last year, right? Stacked thank you. Here. Thank you for your, I do see that. Thank you for your yeah. customer. You have a half of the volume, you know, so. Yeah, so. yeah. Big old Raspberry Pi pyramid. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Alessandro, you look like you want to say something. Sorry. You know, I was just going to say, we've got a lot of questions from the audience. So I'd say, let's scrap some of ours and take some of the audience's questions. Uh, so let's do a rapid fire because we've got a demo to show soon. So, um, so Eben, if you don't mind, let's take some of the questions and, and move quickly, and then we can take some more later on. Um, so I'll start with this one from Israel. Um, so he's asking, we want to see ARM cores plus MCU same die. Um, yeah, with that, with that uh, SOC would be awesome. CM with that SOC would be awesome. Are you considering that? Any thoughts? Um, I think there is a, let's see, there's, well, we don't talk about future products. Um, but there is a, um, there is a, a realization that, that um, uh, real-time IO, real-time controller pins, um, is a MCU-like control of the physical world is a deficiency in the in the core product is something that the core product is not especially good at, um, uh, and, and for all strange applications it doesn't matter. But they, they're still you know we we don't want there to be places that we can't go. So uh, yeah, I suspect we'd we'd like to find a way to do that. Obviously, it is a thing you can do, and we do you know obviously periodically get new silicon for the uh, for, for for the um, for the main thing. So it's probably on the list for Raspberry Pi next. Awesome. Um, thank you for answering that. And the next one is from Larry saying, why did, why did you choose the Cortex-M0 Plus? Uh, there, there are newer cores uh, with more efficient, that are more efficient plus FPU. Uh, was it a cost complexity or die size issue? There aren't newer cores that are more efficient uh, from a power perspective, at least. From an energy perspective, M0 Plus is with two-stage pipeline uh, is, is the most energy efficient core that I'll make. Um, so, so there's a power efficiency point. There is a die size point. It's a very small die. It's a two square mil die, even with all that RAM on it. It's a two square mil die. It means we get 21,000 ish um, die out of a wafer. So you have a 30 centimeter wafer, uh, and you get 21,000. So you know we we order you know you order 100 wafers, which is a modest number, a tiny number of wafers really. Um, you get two million chips. You get two million chips out. Um, so keeping size down was important. We wanted to keep cost under control. Um, uh, you, there, there are some great, there are obviously some great um, other cores um, that we could use that we are aware of that are available on ARM Flexible Access. Um, so, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're aware of the menu. But the M0 Plus is an amazing core. And if you want to do what we want to do, uh, which was to control, well, I'll give you a really simple example. Um, short pipeline, there's no load to use delay, he says, offering hostage to fortune. Um, there's no load to use delay. So if you go and fetch a value from the GPIO pin uh, and the GPIO is mapped on the single cycle IO port, um, you can use it in the next cycle. Uh, there's no other core um, that has that property. So so if I may jump in on, on two things here. One is we're joined by Jessica Tangeman from Hackster. She sends you uh, Hello, her love from the whole Hackster IO family oh, there. So the people. And then she also it's asked... <laughs> we, you know, we miss seeing you guys. Uh, we will come over and say hello very soon. Cool. She also asked a question, though, here, too. So she's interested in knowing if there were any or your most surprising applications that you've seen done so far on the Pico. If you have any uh, 
Can I start waving boards around? You can, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a, well, it's an HDMI connector. It's a, I think people describe it as a not HDMI connector because, of course, it's not standards compliant. Um, but the interesting thing is you can use RP2040 to drive DVI video out. That's probably, I should know, it was actually Luke who did this. So, so I kind of, uh, it wasn't a super big surprise because he, he, I came in one day into the office and there was a demo on his desk. Um, but um, that's a surprise in that it shows how flexible um, the PIO world is, how flexible the IO is. We don't have a DVI control on the, on the chip, and yet you can drive DVI out of it because the PIO is so flexible. And in fact, this is a SparkFun board. SparkFun have made a board. That's, this is their MicroMod world, so they've made a MicroMod card that has RP2040 on, and then they've made this carrier board which converts from this MicroMod format and gives you an SD card and, uh, and an HDMI. So that was a surprise. Really nice surprise, actually, is people have found Luke was able to make this work. Since we launched, people have found ways to program the PIO in ways that make it more efficient to drive DVI out. And it's always a good sign when you make a thing, make a programmable thing, put it in the wild, and people start making it do things that you, that no team member had imagined. And, and um, uh, was it Mike Bell, I think, um, posted this two-line um, PIO program uh, that does uh, differential the differential output for um, PIO when, uh, and Luke and I just wrote it on the whiteboard and just stood there kind of worshipfully just like we're not worthy we're, that's incredible we're not worthy you didn't know it could do that but it can and as soon as you see it you're like yes but of course that's the right way to do it um, so, so that was a fun one Awesome I think that's a good segue actually in, into the demo because um, mm -hmm. so we've got someone to bring on here a new member of the of the arm family that joined us uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so Sun, Sandeep Mystery is on board. Hi, Sandeep. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. So, so yeah, it's you know I think this is a good time to like bring you on and actually uh, have you talk through what you've done and uh, how you've utilized the the PIO um, on the on the on the Raspberry Pi Pico. So um, I think. I mean, you know, I'm sure that we'll have a chat after after you present your um, your demo in your 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 work. Um, actually, before that, though, I wanted to bring up something. Uh, let me just bring up my my screen here. Uh, I forgot. I just wanted to tell everyone if you haven't um, seen Sandeep on Twitter yet, you might have noticed, or if you probably have noticed this tweet. Um, let me just. Is that right? Yeah. So it was interesting, actually. Um, so Sandeep, a couple of weeks ago, tweeted about this project and got quite a few, actually, uh, people interested in this project. So he's been doing uh, some further development. So I just wanted to show this before actually going into the, the demo, just to say that, um, you know, Sandeep is on Twitter. If you've got any questions or things that you want to uh, look at or see or, you know, ask Sandeep, you can do that here or on Twitter afterwards. Um, cool. So Sandeep. Do you want to tell us about your project? Yeah, so um, a few weeks back, I wanted to try out the PIO on the Pico board. And I decided to try to connect it to the internet using Ethernet. Um, so if you buy one of these $2 Ethernet modules from AliExpress or eBay uh, and connect 11 wires to your Pico, you can make it talk Ethernet. Uh, yeah, so I was able to do that, and I learned a lot along the way. Uh, and I'll share some slides on how I was able to do that. Yeah, it's interesting that um, you know it was uh, it was really interesting when that when Raspberry Pi came out. There was a lot of documentation on on everything, and and it was you know it was really cool to see all the applications that came out right away. And and I found yeah. This was uh, this was quite interesting. So yeah, Sandeep, go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so I'm really impressed with the RP2040's uh, parallelism capabilities. Uh, as Evan mentioned, you can have these PIO state machines to control the GPIO. Uh, for my use case, I only needed two of them, but I believe there's eight of them on the chip. And then you can also use the DMA controller, which is direct uh, memory access to copy data to or from the PIO to RAM, and then once that's done, the CPU can uh, process it. So for Ethernet, um, the Ethernet Phi module uh, has this protocol that it sends back, sends data to you. So uh, when data is ready to be clocked out, it's going to 
send one of the pins high and then clock out a preamble on two data pins. And then once the data is ready, uh, the, both the data pins will signal to one and then you can clock out the data. So you can get a ethernet frame like this. And then on the Cortex M0 core, you can easily check the, um, the check sequence to make sure the ethernet packet was correct. So that's handles the receive side. So while that's going, uh, the Cortex M0 plus can also clock out data uh, at the same time. You basically can tell the DMA controller, send this data to the PIO and it's gonna clock out a similar signal where it's gonna set one pin to high, clock out a preamble and signal start a frame and then clock out some data. And that happens asynchronously and let's it uh, Cortex M0 do other things. Uh, and then some cool things from the Raspberry Pi SDK is I was having some issues with clock synchronization. Uh, for RMI, I, you need to have a 50 megahertz reference signal. And it's really awesome. You could, um, in one line of code, you can tell the Raspberry Pi Pico to use pin 20 as an input clock signal and then use it as a system clock. So that's all my synchronization. And one other thing I really liked is the ability to do multi-core. It's also one line. So you basically call this multi-core launch core one func function with a function as an argument. And it will just run that on the secondary core and like one on a code. So that really impressed me. Um, if you wanted to learn more about the project, uh, it's on GitHub at this link, and Alistair Alain from the Raspberry Pi Foundation has already also created a blog post about this. Awesome. I mean, it, it was uh, it was interesting to um, talk talk with you about this this project, and uh, and it, you know it's really cool. Uh, I came from the hardware background, right? And uh, what I've always appreciated about hardware is the the fact that you can do stuff in parallel, right? And here we've got two cores, but we also have these like external modules that uh, basically are able to to do operations while the cores are working as well, right? It's it's super cool. I mean, you know, you've kind of enabled uh, people to come up with different ways of utilizing these uh, these PIOs, and and it's it's super interesting. I mean, did you expect all these applications to come out right away, Eben? I, I think we're always surprised with Raspberry Pi how quickly the cool stuff appears. So this is a, this is a wonderful example of outside the team, you know, where the, the DVI example is a nice example, but it's it's technically inside the team, even if it's sort of an evening project. This is a wonderful example from outside the team of of uh, finding a protocol that we weren't aware of, we weren't really aware of, uh, you know, we were aware of it but hadn't ever looked at it, and finding that it maps naturally onto the the resources in the chip. So that's a really good, that's a, a little bit like the improved DVI thing. It's a really good sign that we've hopefully um, found a, a natural feature set um, for the for the PIO processors. Um, it's interesting, I mean, you mentioned documentation. A lot of effort went into documentation. Alistair um, joined uh, Raspberry Pi uh, with the mission to go and make the documentation for this chip good at launch. Uh, and he, he's um, it's not, it's a, a thousand pages of documentation. He obviously didn't write it all himself. Um, the team wrote it, but Alistair was sort of marshaled that uh, process, wrote some parts of it, and also got it all into one voice. Because you have a lot of people, we're very lucky, our engineering team here, um, they tend to, be, tend to be very good at writing documentation. They tend to be, they tend, they're responsible in writing documentation, and their, um, their documentation is readable. Um, but it's still 15 different people's voices. And one of the things our Alistair has done is to take those voices and turn them into something that feels like a coherent product. You also mentioned the SDK. Um, that's been quite a substantial effort, um, trying to make sure that the SDK is good on day one. Um, Graham Sanderson, um, uh, who works for Russian plant out, out in Texas, um, sort of took the lead on that and has really put a lot of effort into just trying to make sure um, that it 
that, that just works. You know, things like your example there of, 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 of multi-core launch, that people have the primitives they need on day one to do interesting things with the chip and get, you know, I'm sure the SDK will get better over time. There are, there's a there's a sort of a parallel SDK world called Pico Extras, a parallel repo called Pico Extras, which is the stuff which is cool but isn't quite ready for the prime time yet. And that will migrate into the SDK over time. But this was this was a lovely example. And I'm hoping what we get is a world of IoT widgets, Ethernet connected IoT widgets which are using this um, uh, this approach um, to talk to uh, to talk to the outside world. You know, uh, I, I I started off as a technical documenter, and Raspberry Pi has for me always been kind of the standard. You mm. you all have done such a great job with documentation. Anytime I would launch anything or write anything, I'd always want to go back to Raspberry Pi's website, the stuff that you all have created, and said, okay, I mean, are we are we doing things right? Because I mean, as you can tell, even people are commenting in the chat right now, you, you are all kind of like best in class here for, for when it comes to documentation. So kudos to you and your team for that. I, I really do think it echoes across the developer ecosystem that you all have great documentation. It's an important part. It's a, it's a really important part. It's easy to forget when you're a technologist, it's easy to forget that, that a big part of having an impact is helping other people understand what it was you did. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Robert. Yeah. Of course. No, thank you. So Alessandro, do we, should we move on? Cause we have another segment. We wanted to kind of celebrate some stuff here, but what do you, what, do you, what should we do now, Alessandro? Yeah, let's do that. I think, I think actually, you know, we, we just brought up the fact that Eben just brought up the fact that, um, you know, you need to enable others to, um, to kind of understand what you did and, and build up upon it. Right. So I think this is actually a good segue into our next part, right? Let's celebrate some of the successes of the RP2040. So we're talking about the chip, right? And, you know, how, Eben, when was it launched exactly? How many months, weeks ago? 26th, he says, guessing wildly of January. Okay. I think. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. So, so not, not too long ago, and we already see uh, a lot of different boards that are actually uh, coming out with, uh, with the RP2040 on board. <laughs> so, Perfect. Robert, yeah, you brought up something here. What is this? Oh, there you go. Evans even this is, I think, the left-hand one. This one is, I think, the Pro Micro one. So these are. This is the um, uh, the smartphone. One of the smartphone products that you that you mentioned. Um, it's got an RP twenty forty. Um, uh, a really large slug of flash on there. We have external flash, which is nice to give people the ability to choose how much non-volatile memory they want to put on the board. They put a lot in that package there. Um, USB C. Where we chose micro B, so it's an interesting, interesting choice. Um, lots of GPIO, a couple of buttons, and on the end here, this is a quick connector. This is um, um, a, a smartphone standard for uh, interfacing external modules like this, which is a te atmospheric sensor, temperature and pressure sensor. Uh, this thing, which is a little display, these all have these little quick ports on them, um, and you can use that to sort of string together a chain of uh, of things off the end of a off the end of one of these. So that's a really good example of something where, you know, you compare it to a Pico. I don't know if you have a bare Pico, but that's a Pico there on the end. Um, on a, this is a this is an accessory board. This is a um, uh, Pico RGB keypad from Pimeroni. Um, but, you know, you look at it, it's a lot smaller. It's going to be a lot smaller. It's got a lot more storage. It's got a different price point. Got a different, and it interfaces to the quick world, which we don't have support for natively. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna show these these on the yeah. website, but if you have them on hand, well, shall, probably... shall, I, shall I do the quick? Shall I do the? Shall I do it because I've got a table here. Of, oh, uh, let's do that. Stuff, right? Let let's me show. Okay, this one I showed you before. Uh, this is the, the the DVI output board, but it has this micro mod. So again, talking about interfacing RP2040 to other ecosystems of um, components. So this interfaces to the micro mod um, a world, which uses these um, M2. Uh, M2 connectors. Um, we have a couple of Adafruit products. We've got a Qt Pi 2040. That really is absolutely tiny. Stuff packed on both sides of the board. Again, lots more storage on that than we have on uh, uh, on the uh, on the core board. Um, this one is a Itsy Bitsy. So this is another Adafruit um, another Adafruit uh, form factor, a little bit bigger. Than the cutie pie, a little bit smaller than the feather. I think you, you guys have a feather kicking around there somewhere. Um, another tiny one. This is a tiny 2040 from um, uh, from Pimereni. 
Um, it's probably, I think it was the first third party board to get out of the market. Um, uh, and that's lovely. It's got a couple of buttons. It's got a NeoPixel in the middle, so it's got RGB and RGB LED in the middle. So that's kind of fun. Um, and then there's kind of a world of um, the other the other one I have, and these is rarer than uh, Rocking Horse droppings. Um, this is a Pico system. So this is a little games console um, that uh, Pimeroni are building uh, based on RP2040. It's not released yet, which is why I'm super pleased to have one. And I suppose I have to send it back up to Sheffield. But yeah, that's uh, that's going to be awesome when it comes out. I'm really going to show off a lot of the features in RP2040, actually. People have demoed um, uh, game emulators, old 8-bit computer emulators running on on the platform. So lots of graphical stuff there. So those are all things that are based on 2040. Um, and then you have a world of accessories as well. So you have things like this that um, this is a called a, I forget what the name of this is, uh, unicorn, isn't it? This is a unicorn accessory, uh, again from Pimeroni, uh, for the Pi. Uh, you have breakout boards. You saw the, the, the digital video, the DVI one from SparkFun. This is an analog one. This one's got a VGA connector on it, so you can use PIO to drive VGA signals out. So that's the kind of analog version of the previous one. I'll show you this keypad. Um, so there's lots of stuff going on already. You know, there's already there's already interesting accessories, interesting boards that use RP2040. Even though we're not supporting the broad market, we are supporting a small number of uh, of our closest friends with with, with samples. Um, uh, and then there's a lot of accessories going on. So it's a lot of stuff has happened in, in the two months since Pico and RP2040 hit the market. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting actually. Wings. There's an Arduino product. There it is. There's an Arduino in the wings. So I talk about our closest friends. These are some of our very, very closest friends. Look yeah, it's, it's really interesting way. to see. Yeah, it's really interesting to see all these different boards. And, you know, they all come with like, you know, with a different flavor, a different uh, take on the on the RP2040 and what it's uh, capable of. And uh, they all come with different peripheries. I mean, this Arduino one has a lot of sensors on board mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's got a um, uh, bigger flash. It's got... Uh, uh, what else does it have? I think it's got a Wi-Fi module on it, so it's quite interesting because you know everybody's kind of done their spin on on what the um, you know what, what what could be built with this with this uh, RP twenty forty, and and it's interesting. I mean, were you expecting all these uh, boards to come out right away, uh, or you know, is that something you planned for? Um, I think it's something we hoped for. I don't think it's something you can plan for because, of course, you depend on other people for it. Um, but you know, something we'd hope for. Um, and these are, you know, these four companies we're talking about here, uh, Adafruit, Sparkfun, Pimeroni, uh, Arduino. They're four companies that do, uh, the, the, they're four of the companies we respect the most, four of the companies with whom we have the longest relationship. Arduino, obviously, a, co a company that, that substantially predates uh, Raspberry Pi and, and has been an inspiration to us in what we've done in the... Um, uh, what we've done in the single board computer space. So it was really a desire once we, we knew we were going to have a piece of silicon to see whether we could work with Arduino to kind of help their help their ecosystem benefit from the RP2040 platform. Uh, I had one more. I had one more little. This is the this is a little screen, little beautiful. Oh, that's super board. cool. Super cool, right? And again, kind of really showing off the graphical power of the uh, platform. There's another Pimeroni product called Pico Display. Nice. So. I want to be conscious of, of time here, Evan, respecting, I know you're super busy here. Uh, you know, everyone who's watching, thank you, everyone. Uh, Evan, we want to give you at least like a shameless plug here. We usually do that for all of our guests. If you have anything, call to action, let the viewers know what you'd like them to go check out. Uh, and then we're going to close this episode out. Um, so please. Let me do an educational call to action. Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi Foundation um, is, um, is all about getting people interested in and excited about computers. Um, uh, th there are lots of, there are lots of um, programs that you know, we run a, a couple of giant networks of after school clubs, Code Club and Code Dojo. So there are lots of sort of formal ways that you can get involved in helping people you know, go volunteer at a Code Club. Um, lots of great formal ways that you can get involved. If you're a technical person, you can get involved in helping the next generation get excited about computers. Um, but what I wanted to plug was that you should try the personal thing too. Uh, I'm sure all of us who are in computing have adults we can point to, people who are adults when we were children, who kept us interested in computers and nurtured our interest, um, without whom we probably wouldn't have got anywhere. Um, I picked one person, a guy called Alan Drew, um, uh, was a, a, a chap who I knew when I was when I was young, and every Friday night he'd pick me up 
um, with my BBC Micro, pack my BBC Micro in a, in, a, in its um, polystyrene container, and he would pick me up and take me to Computer Club every Friday. And going to Computer Club was the thing that kept me interested in computers. Um, try and be that person for some young person. Please do scalable things like volunteering in clubs and stuff. But in your personal life, try to find the young people around you who have an interest or an enthusiasm for this and nurture that interest and enthusiasm because those young people need you because otherwise they might fall off and, and forget all about it. Uh, it's always one of the you know, things that make us happy or when we meet young people who are excited about computers. Things that make us a little bit sad are we we do meet people who have re-engaged with computers because of Raspberry Pi. And they've re-engaged during adulthood and have stories about how they fell away from computing as a child because they didn't have that person. Be that person in someone's life. There you are. That's a call to action. You gave me gave me goosebumps, Evan. I, I swear that has got to be the best call to action we've gotten on this show so far, Alessandro. That I agree. Right yeah, that was, yeah, that was that's, that's very good. Cool. Yeah, and you know it does it does show that you've got the passion to like actually, actually you know educate as many people as possible. That's what you've been doing for the last uh, how many years, right? So that's that's awesome. Uh, I've got before closing, I've got a cheeky question for you, Evan. Um, so the question is really. You know, it's been awesome to like see this RP twenty forty come out, and uh, you know, it's been the first MCU that you've ever done, and actually, you've actually done it yourself, right? You've built it from scratch. My question is: Is this going to be the only uh, MCU? Is this going to be the only chip that you built, or are you, uh, you know, planning to do more? And you know, feel free to not answer if you can't. <laughs> but, you know, um, we don't talk about announced products, but there's a wonderful. If you're aware of an author called Neil Stevenson, uh, who wrote some amazing novels, including Snow Crash uh, and Cryptonomicon. And in Cryptonomicon, one of the characters is asked by another character, "Yeah, I think about something like laying submarine cables in the Philippines or something. Do you, are you going to do another one after you've done this one?" And his reply is, "Business people don't like to do things once; it makes a mess of the spreadsheets." <laughs> I love that. You are. That's my answer. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, I mean, thank you all for watching. It's been awesome. Um, there was a lot of you on today. And uh, uh, as always, you can find the episode afterwards if you haven't had the chance to watch it all. Um, and Robert, what do yeah, you want to add? One, what, one last thing here. Uh, of course, Evan, thank you so much for your time. Sandeep, thank you so much for the demo. That was awesome. Everyone watching, thank you for your time. I know we didn't get to get to everyone's questions. So if you had a question in the chat and we didn't get to answer that, please wait for the video to publish. It should happen shortly after the live stream ends. Post it in the comment section and we'll do our best to get that question answered post-show. Maybe Evan can help us find someone or we'll just try to answer it ourselves. So post that in the comments. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the Arm Software Developer YouTube channel um, as soon as possible because we do this every week. So um, big thank you to everyone involved here today and thank you to all the viewers. Alessandro, let's close this out. Let's close it. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Bye, Sandeep. Bye, Robert. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.